The major reason why no government in the world wants its people to know the whole story about flying saucers, aside from the primary concern of how do you duplicate the flight propulsion system, which you certainly aren't going to tell your enemies about, is a very simple-minded one that no government wants its people to start thinking of themselves as Earthlings instead of as Americans or Russians or Chinese or whatever. The whole way that this world is structured is predicated on a system of nationalistic uh, competitions. I don't care whether it's the Olympics or the battlefield. The problem is the same. Or the development of nuclear weapons systems. And so, from an alien viewpoint, it's clear we're a primitive society whose major activity is tribal warfare. It's further clear that, despite all the jokes about take me to your leader, that there is no leader to be taken to. Dr. Stanton Friedman was a nuclear physicist and acclaimed ufologist, ufology being the study of unidentified flying objects. Dr. Friedman was the first civilian investigator of the so-called Roswell incident. His many books and public presentations were criticized by some of his fellow scientists and government officials. In May of this year, Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security, Ronald Moultrie, and Deputy Director of Naval Intelligence Scott Bray testified before a House subcommittee. They revealed the Defense Department is organizing reports of UAPs, or Unidentified Aerial Phenomena, after a congressionally mandated report released last year found most of the incidents analyzed remained unidentified. The government's seeming admission that UFOs may be real appears to vindicate Dr. Friedman. In 1975, I interviewed Dr. Friedman prior to his lecture at the University of California in Berkeley. Join us on the Plutopia podcast as we revisit that interview and lecture. I have bachelor's and master's degrees in physics from the University of Chicago and 14 years of industrial experience in the development of a whole variety of advanced nuclear and space systems, uh, far out things like nuclear rockets, nuclear airplanes, nuclear power plants for space, for little companies like General Electric, General Motors, Westinghouse. For the last six years, I've been, so far as can be determined, the only space scientist in the world known to be devoting full time to flying saucers. Primarily, that means giving a lecture, flying saucers are real, on something over 300 college campuses in 45 states, several dozen professional groups as well. I first got interested in UFOs way back in 1958. I was a skeptic, but happened to read a book and then read 15 more books. And it was Air Force data that finally convinced me. I found a copy of something I hadn't known existed, a Project Blue Book Special Report Number 14, which was the only pseudo or semi-scientific study the Air Force ever put out on UFOs and had information on, oh, 2,199 sightings and a categorization and quality evaluation, all kinds of good data. I was shocked by the fact that 20% of the sightings couldn't be explained. The better the quality of the report, the more likely to be unexplainable. And yet the public was told by the Secretary of the Air Force that even the unknown 3% could have been identified if only more data had been available. The fact of the matter is the unknowns were 20 percent, and they were completely separate from the settings for which there wasn't enough data. Well, that was a long time ago, but it certainly alerted me and didn't really do much about UFOs until approximately 1967. Lectured in somebody's living room, lectured in a lot of uh, Kiwanis Club sort of things. Finally hit engineering societies, universities, found that there was enormous interest in what I had to say from my professional colleagues. And in 1970, when the aerospace nuclear business sort of went to pot entirely, and after I got tired of working on my umpteenth canceled program, I decided let's do something you enjoy. <laughs> and so it's been the last six years that I've been traveling all over the continent. I find that there's enormous interest in flying saucers. I have plenty of feedback. I don't just go in, do my thing, and leave. I have a question and answer period after every lecture. I visit many classrooms. I've been interviewed on hundreds of shows, I guess. And I find that. Uh, Several things. People are ready, willing, and able to accept UFO reality. I would certainly agree with the Gallup poll showing that the majority of adult Americans do believe in UFOs, that the older the individual, the less likely to believe, that the more educated, the more likely to believe. I find that people don't believe the government's told them the whole story. There's nothing surprising about that, I guess. But that was even true uh, eight or nine years ago, long before Watergate. And frankly, I'm also convinced that we're dealing with a kind of cosmic Watergate here. I find that. UFO sightings are really quite common, 
uh, everybody's surprised at the end of my lecture when I ask how many people have seen a UFO, or something I would consider, and my standards are fairly tight. And invariably, you get anywhere from 3 to 10 percent of the people attending, and that's as many as 2,000 people, uh, raising their hands. Usually, initially, they raise them very reluctantly until I start counting out loud, and they realize they're not the only ones, as each one right. seems to think he is. But then I ask, how many of you reported what you saw? And if I'm lucky, it's one in 20 of those who have seen one. What is the reason most people give for not reporting it? Well, when they talk to me privately, the biggest reason given is they'd think I was some kind of a nut. The fear of ridicule is apparently a predominant factor in the whole UFO scene. And one of my goals is to lift the laughter curtain, to get people to start thinking, stop laughing, and to recognize that they're not alone in their acceptance of UFO phenomena. I've, I've gone into a class and asked, say, 100 people, how many of you believe most people don't believe in UFOs? 75% of the hands go up. How many of you do believe in UFOs? 75% of the hands go up. So it's a taboo subject. In other words, each person thinks his own views are different from other people, so he's afraid to express them. And I give them a focal point for expressing them. And I should stress that, in the first place, I've never had any personal experiences. My lectures are not regaling people with my trips to Venus kind of nonsense. They're not my personal sightings. Second place, I should stress, that there's an enormous amount of data which simply hasn't been seen out in public. It's not that you can't get it. But, for example, I deal with five large-scale scientific studies in my lecture. And I af ask after each one, how many people here have read this one, this one, this one, right on down the line? And I never get more than 2% of the people who've read any of them. And yet it's kind of funny. The strongest negative viewpoints come from the professional people who know the least about the subject. And my own feeling is, darn it, that if you're going to express a professional viewpoint as opposed to a personal private viewpoint, that one ought to know what one is talking about. That means to study the data or to shut up. There are so many pronouncements from on high. It's so easy to put down what one is not up on, as somebody once said. One of the things that, uh, about UFOs that intrigues a lot of people is the whole question of can you get here from there? And the evidence indicates we're dealing with intelligently controlled extraterrestrial vehicles, or they're dealing with us. I'm not sure we're dealing with them. And that these come from other solar systems, not other galaxies, not a long ways away, say within 50 light years. There's 46 interesting star systems within 50 light years. But a lot of people have been brainwashed into thinking that you can't get here from there. They think that because it takes you X hours to get to the moon and because the stars are um, Y times further away, that you must multiply the time to the moon by Y. And that's simply not true, not if you look at things in the way a sensible engineering approach to the whole problem of propulsion would look at it. Uh, for example, there are published studies by reputable engineers and scientists showing that trips to nearby stars are feasible with round trip times shorter than 60 years without violating any of the laws of physics and using techniques that we know about today, typically staged fission or fusion propulsion systems, and I've worked on both. Now, the negativists, of course, have never heard of either one of these development programs. And it's funny, the whole history of science, say for the last hundred years, is full of pronouncements. In 1903, it was proven by a great astronomer that one couldn't fly in an airplane, only a lighter than aircraft uh, could move in the sky. In the mid-20s, a professor proved that you couldn't get to escape velocity. Too much energy would be required. In the early 40s, a, the head of the Canadian Astronomical Association clearly mathematically demonstrated that if you wanted to get a man to the moon and back, the initial launch weight would have to be only a million, million tons. He, of course, did it with 3,000 tons. So he was off a thousand million. <laughs> That's how much he was off in his weight factor. Uh, in 1957, Dr. Lee DeForest, who invented the vacuum tube, father of modern electronics, great man, stated that uh, the notion that man would go soon to the moon, would land, get back alive to Earth with samples for analysis here, that notion was the wildest science fiction worthy of a Jules Verne. He was bold enough to state that no matter what the discoveries of the future, that would never happen. It took 12 years. So you'd think that we'd learn by looking backwards how to look forwards. And, you know, if there were no other reasons for studying UFOs, the technological, pragmatic ones are certainly worth the effort. Now, let's, let's get down to brass tacks. It is accepted in the United States and in other countries that it is appropriate to spend a lot of money developing better propulsion systems. Uh, the B-1 bomber is a classical example. The development costs several billion dollars each plane, and when it finally gets built, if it does, will be something over $75 million apiece. So we have a national commitment the F-16, 17, 18, right on down the line. And yet none of these craft, 
or even the space shuttle, which is to get us into orbit, none of these crafts have the very exciting flight capabilities of flying saucers. And the motherships, too, the much larger non-saucer-shaped uh, objects. So if you want to build something that works better, why not study the things that already have accomplished that? The second level of pragmatic concern, it's already been accepted in this country that it's suitable, a suitable national goal, to look for life off the Earth. Uh, the Viking spacecraft, which will send down landers on Mars uh, this summer, the cost of that program is $1 billion. The primary goal is to find out is there life on Mars. A million dollars properly spent for the right things down here ought to tell us all anybody ever wanted to know about flying saucers. That is, by lifting the, the security lid that has obscured the best data which has been obtained by the government. Uh, on a different kind of level, it's been seriously proposed that NASA build Project Cyclops, a big eye on the sky, a 10-mile wide array of radio telescopes, purpose to listen for signals from outer space, because by some weird reasoning, obviously intelligent critters out there have a beacon broadcasting, hello Earth, hello Earth, waiting for us to respond so we can join the galactic radio network, and it's great job security for radio astronomers. You know, you send out hello, and 20 years later it comes back, uh, hi there, and 20 years later, you know, it's, it's a great thing for radio astronomers. Makes no sense at all. It assumes the aliens are stuck at the level of radio. It assumes that somebody is, cares to announce itself to us. It assumes that you can't get here from there, despite the fact that there's all this enormous amount of data that the radio astronomers haven't looked at, that indicates not only that there are flying saucers in our skies from other solar systems, but landings, complete with critters. One recent compilation showed that more than 800 landing trace cases are on file from 39 countries. These are cases where the UFO has been on or near the ground, and when it leaves, one finds physical changes in the environment. And about a quarter of those cases involve reports of critters. So they have landed, they are coming here, and yet these guys want to build a 10-mile-wide radio telescope. What do you feel is a more reasonable approach to this? What do you feel should be done instead of spending money on seeing if there's life on Mars, see if there's life visiting Earth? Is that what you propose? Yeah, when we have, we have no data at all on which to base a real search for life on the surface of Mars. We don't know what the conditions are. We don't know what microbes are there. We don't know what form of life exists there. We're searching blind. And it's a, sure, it's a masterpiece of technology that we can get a relatively lightweight device to land there and get all the data that the Viking spacecraft is capable of getting. So I'm not knocking the technology. But we're shooting in the dark. Yes, I think that the way to spend money is looking at the UFO data. The first thing is to do the kind of job on UFOs that the Washington Post and other newspapers did on Watergate. I have talked in the past six or seven years to more than 60 former servicemen who have told me of excellent sightings that occurred while they were in the service where the data did not go to Project Blue Book, ostensibly the Air Force group concerned with UFOs, but instead typically went to the Aerospace Defense Command and where the security lid was clamped down immediately. Now, if I can find 60 people just in wandering around the country, lecturing all over the place, and without the protection that a newsman has for his sources, and without making that my primary effort, then surely any major media effort would be successful, especially when I have a letter from a senator saying that the Air Force says there's no longer anything classified about UFOs. I don't happen to believe that, but it certainly would make it difficult to prosecute anybody for breaking secrecy when there supposedly aren't any such secrets to break out in the open. So really it's no, uh, no offense to reveal a secret that doesn't exist? One would think not. I mean, how in the world can the Air Force or the government stand up and say, you will be prosecuted as the Daniel Ellsberg of the UFO world to somebody when they have told the Senate in black and white that there are no longer any things classified about UFOs? I think one needs to recognize something here, though, that's related to this political aspect of things. And that is that the major reason why no government in the world wants its people to know the whole story about flying saucers, aside from the primary concern of how do you duplicate the flight propulsion system, which you certainly aren't going to tell your enemies about, is the very simple-minded one that no government wants its people to start thinking of themselves as Earthlings instead of as Americans or Russians or Chinese or whatever. The whole way that this world is structured is predicated on a system of nationalistic uh, competitions I don't care whether it's the Olympics or the battlefield. The problem is the same. Or the development of nuclear weapons systems. 
And so from an alien viewpoint, it's clear we're a primitive society whose major activity is tribal warfare. It's further clear that despite all the jokes about take me to your leader, that there is no leader to be taken to. The planet Earth doesn't have a spokesman. There's nobody who can negotiate for the planet. I suppose Henry Kissinger comes as close as anybody at the moment. But, you know, it, it may sound like a simple-minded question. Who speaks for the planet? How will we decide? Well, we'll hold an election. Are we going to give the Chinese four times as many votes as we have? That'll be the day. <laughs> or that you say, well, on a per square mile basis, we're going to give the Russians three times as many votes as we have? We can't even settle on the shape of a negotiating table. So a lot of this nonsense that you will get from people, I know one scientist who has publicly stated if aliens were visiting Earth, they would, of course, wish to either land on the White House lawn, as if the president somehow spoke for planet Earth, or that the aliens would wish to talk to the National Academy of Sciences, of which this, member, this person happened to be a member. And his whole attitude was, uh, haven't asked for an appointment, must not be coming here. The ego notions here are really rather enormous. You know, if somebody was coming here, it has to be to talk to us as if we were worth talking to. I don't think we are. And how are they going to know where to land if they're not familiar with the culture? Well, listening to radio and television programs would give them some clues, but it is obviously not safe to land. Every major government would love to get its mitts on a flying saucer because they do make wonderful weapons delivery systems. I mean, rule number one for a UFO not has to be make sure you can get home. One of the common answers that people give to what are flying saucers is that it's some other government or our government testing. How do you handle uh, this attempt to explain it? Well, there's no doubt that some UFOs are indeed of earthly origin. Most IFOs are, of course, identifiable flying. Some unidentifiable ones are, too. I can think of a specific instance when uh, a newsman at White Sands Proving Ground in New Mexico ran across this big, round, conical thing with legs and uh, asked about it, and they very embarrassingly told him that it was in the scrap pile now, but this thing had been launched from like 50,000 feet and sent down to test some uh, re-entry systems, and had undoubtedly been responsible for flying saucer reports, because when you look at it, it's a big flying saucer. But if you go back, say, to the late 1940s, when there were sightings all over the world, as there are now and have continued to be ever since then, you have to say that there wasn't anybody on this planet who at that time could build things that both looked and acted like the flying saucers that were observed. Speeds of 10,000 miles an hour without uh, sound, without noise, without sonic booms, rather, without uh, wings, without visible external engines, without an exhaust, uh, in something that was round, definite size, shape, surface texture, symmetric object. Uh, if there was anybody around who could in quantity, because people often reported seeing whole flocks of these, who could in quantity build things that have the, both the appearance and behavioral characteristics of flying saucers, Today's world power situation simply would not be the way it is. We wouldn't be building F-16, 17, 18s, or Saturn V rockets. And so uh, that hopefully major governments are working to duplicate UFO flight characteristics. People like statistics and uh, mathematical probabilities. Would you assign any kind of uh, probability to where the, uh, whether these are from deep space, from nearby, or you know where they would be from? Do you have any kind of a speculation that you can get? Well, there's no way to assign probability. There is one very involved, very detailed case, the abduction of Betty and Barney Hill, as described in the book The Interrupted Journey, as portrayed on television in the show uh, The UFO Incident on October 20th, uh, 1975. In the course of that investigation, detailed hypnosis, uh, reliving of the experience over many months, weekly sessions for two people. Uh, there was a star map brought forth that is Betty Hill uh, wrote or drew, I guess is a better word, a star map that she had seen. A lot of work with that star map, and without going into the details because it's very detailed and very long and difficult explanation, but f out of that work comes the notion that those particular critters come from Zeta-1 or Zeta-2 reticuli, that is, planets around these two stars in the constellation of Reticulum, which is only visible from below the equator. And these two stars are a mere 37 light years away, which is really just down the street. In a galaxy, it's 100,000 light years across. 37 isn't a very big number. On top of that, these stars just happen, and this was found out afterward, happen to be the closest to each other pair of stars suitable for planets and life in our neighborhood. 
Uh, the sun's nearest neighbor, because we're out in the boondocks, is like five light years away. These two stars are both suitable for planets and life, and yet they're only a 20th of a light year apart. It's 100 times closer, so it's an entirely different situation. I mean, you go to Congress for money for an interstellar space job, they say, where are you going? Oh, just over the neighbors. How do you know there's anything there? Well, we can see the planets with our telescope, and we can pick up their television advertising. We know they've got some things we don't have. And besides, it only takes three weeks to get over there anyway, so no big deal. In other words, it wouldn't at all be surprising if the earliest interstellar travel and communication took place where the nearest neighbor was close instead of far. We can't even see the smoke from the next guy's chimney. These guys have next door neighbors. And so uh, this work associated with the flying saucer sighting is very provocative, and it also points out the need to look at the total picture, not to assume that everybody is stuck with having to go five light years before they find somebody interesting to talk to. Uh, one of the things that uh, kind of floors people, too, is not only the distances, but I think it's necessary that we acknowledge that we've only had sophisticated technology for 100 years in a system which is five billion years old. And yet in 100 years, we've increased our top speed for people at least a 1,000 times over. So you have to allow room for somebody else to get started on his or her technological kick a little bit before we did. But you know what's a little bit out of five billion years? Uh, especially since technological progress, almost invariably, comes from doing things differently in an unpredictable way. The notion that we sitting here can tell what the technology of even 100 years from now will be, no less a 1,000 or a million, which is still nothing out of five billion, is just utter uh, nonsense just totally ridiculous, and yet it happens all the time. People say it's impossible. What they should have said was, I don't know how to do that. And so we need the time and the distance perspective. We need to recognize that getting off the Earth is the biggest part of the battle of getting to the stars. We also need to recognize that we are all Earthlings, governments, generals, notwithstanding. We all live on the same little planet, and to an outsider's viewpoint, the color of our skins, the country of national origin, our sex, none of these things can be terribly important. Thank you. I think people around here must be afraid of physicists. Why don't you come up a little closer so you can see the slides, so you can react with me? Are you, are you afraid to sit up front? I don't know what you were expecting tonight. Some of those posters would have scared me, I think. <laughs> I think everybody here is here who's coming here anyway, so we might as well start at the, the beginning or the top line, if you will. Let me tell you where I'm at. I'm sure that some people who saw the posters that are on campus uh, must be wondering whether, it, whether this was all a big joke or serious or whatever. Let's get rid of all those concerns. After 18 years of study and investigation, I'm convinced that the evidence is overwhelming that our planet, Earth, is being visited by intelligently controlled vehicles from off the Earth. In other words, some UFOs are somebody else's spacecraft. You can underline this some several times. Some are all kinds of other things. We don't care about those. Now, the kind of evidence I'm talking about, eyewitness testimony from responsible, respectable people from all over the world, landing cases involving physical changes in the environment, reports of critters associated with craft, radar visual cases, photographs. We'll get into all of these things and a lot more as we go along tonight. The place to start, of course, the UFO sighting reports, things that people have seen that they couldn't explain, that they told somebody else about. There are three categories of UFO sighting reports. And it's quite important that we distinguish amongst these three groups. Otherwise, we wind up with total confusion. And Lord knows there's enough of that about this subject as it is. The first category of UFO sighting reports. Now, Lee, can we have the lights up? That's right. We're not a performer behind, hiding behind the lights down here. We have the slides on. We can drop them down a bit. The first category of UFO sighting reports includes those reports by competent or not so competent observers of strange phenomena in the sky or on the ground, which the observer cannot identify, but which can be identified by competent investigators spending enough time, money, and effort. All sorts of things in this category. And of course, these are the only sightings that the skeptics talk about. 
But these sightings are, by definition, all IFOs, identifiable flying objects. For the rest of my lecture, let's forget IFOs. Because once a sighting has been explained, it's of no further use in the search for truth about unidentifiable flying objects. So forget category one. It's there. It's really irrelevant. Category two also must be dismissed because it includes only those reports for which not enough information is obtained for a competent investigator to reach some sort of sensible deduction as to what was observed. If you don't have enough data about the sighting, you can study the report for the next 10 years and not learn anything useful about unidentifiable flying objects. So it leaves us only with the sightings in category three on which to base any sort of rational or logical deduction as to the identity, identification, identity of flying saucers. These are the reports by competent observers of strange phenomena in the sky or on the ground, which the observer cannot identify, and which remain unidentified after investigation by competent investigators, and which furthermore we judge to be manufactured objects based on the way they look, and to have been manufactured elsewhere than on Earth based on the way they behave. And we therefore deduce that we are dealing with intelligently controlled extraterrestrial vehicles, spacecraft from someplace other than Earth. Now that's a lot of kicks on that last definition. And the skeptic at this point, and I suppose in an audience this size, there ought to be three or four skeptics anyway. The skeptic would say, hey, with that last def definition, he just killed the rest of his lecture. Because we all know, since we hear it so often from the noisy negativists, that there aren't any good sightings by competent observers that can't be identified by competent investigators, and certainly none that indicate that we're dealing with extraterrestrial spacecraft. Right? Wrong. Totally and completely false. Absolutely untrue. Definitely incorrect. I hope you get the point I'm trying to make. A major point I am trying to make tonight is that every large-scale scientific study of UFOs, and I'll discuss five of them, has produced a substantial number of Category 3 sightings. Competent observer, competent investigator, plenty of data, and every indication we're dealing with extraterrestrial spacecraft. The problem, of course, is that most people, and especially the noisy skeptics, aren't familiar with the data, with the large-scale or small-scale scientific studies for that matter. So I'd like to devote the first portion of my lecture to a review of the data. After all, everybody seems to have an opinion about UFOs. Shouldn't they be based on the mountain of information that's available? I think they should. The largest official scientific comprehensive study of UFOs ever done was completed way back in 1955 by the Battelle Memorial Institute in Columbus, Ohio. BMI, as it's usually called, is a very well-respected research and development firm. They work for the government, for different companies. They developed the Xerox process, for example. They were under contract to one of the United States Air Force groups concerned with UFOs, namely Project Blue Book, located at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, just outside Dayton, Ohio, which isn't far from Columbus, which is how they got in the action in the first place. And it was Patel's job to go through all the sightings in the Air Force files for the period 1947 to 1952, and some thereafter. More than 2,000 UFO sighting reports were carefully investigated. Every one of these sightings was eventually categorized as something or other. You know, aircraft, balloon, astronomical, my three categories. They had all sorts of information available about each sighting. So they were also evaluated as to quality. I mean, presumably a report from, say, a physicist, a pilot, and a priest of something observed uh, from 50 yards away for half an hour in broad daylight would be considered a somewhat higher quality report than one of a light zipping by in the sky as observed for three seconds at four in the morning by a drunken bum. It's a subjective evaluation, but it's a meaningful one. All right, they had all this information, charts and tables and graphs and maps, categorization information, the quality evaluation. All this stuff was put together in a big fat report. Project Blue Book, special report number 14. It's rather interesting that nothing that the Air Force put out then or since identified the title of the report, who did the work, or where the work was done. And if 
if they had mentioned the title, you see, I'm sure that some newsman, none of whom asked any of these things, some newsman would have said, what do you mean, special report number 14, what happened to reports 1 through 13? We've never heard anything about them. The true answers, had they been given, would have been that reports 1 through 12 were all classified, either secret or confidential. They've since been declassified, and we have the original security markings on them. 13 is the interesting one. The three different stories, you pays your money and takes your choice. One is the Air Force was so superstitious, it never issued a report 13. That one I can't swallow at all, frankly. The second one, if you write the Air Force, about half the time they'll send you back a letter stating that Blue Book Report 13 was prepared in rough draft form and then incorporated in Blue Book Report 14. Having read 1 through 12, 14, and the Battelle progress reports for this period of time, I can't find anything to substantiate that, and the Air Force could provide nothing to substantiate it. And finally, there's a third story, and this is the one I buy. I met a man several years ago who says that he saw a copy of Blue Book Report 13 in the classified files at a Strategic Air Command base, and that the report was still top secret four years ago. This one I believe. This comment set the tone for what most newsmen and scientists came to think about UFOs, at least back in the mid-50s. The date in the newspapers was October 26, 1955, for this statement by Donald Quarles, who was then Secretary of the Air Force. Quote, on the basis of this study, we believe that no objects such as those properly described as flying saucers have overflown the United States. I feel certain that even the unknown 3% could have been explained as conventional phenomena or illusions if more complete observational data had been available." Unquote. Now, there are apparently two factual statements there, which taken together throw out my third category of reports. That is to say, the unknowns number only 3%, and the only reason they were unknown is because there wasn't enough data, that is, they were actually Category 2 sightings, and so we can forget flying science. That's what the public was told. Newspapers all across the country, Los Angeles Times not only quoted that statement, but ran an editorial saying, we knew all along that this stuff was nonsense. 1955, that was 21 years later. They still haven't changed their mind. Now, the only thing wrong with those two supposedly factual statements is that they are both completely false. Why do I say that? Let's look at the next slide and we'll find out. This is the categorization information of 2,199 sightings, many of them multiple witness sightings. The first three categories are pretty obvious, astronomical, aircraft, balloon. Other is miscellaneous. That covers all kinds of stuff. So you name it, somebody's reported it at one time or another. And yes, the crackpot cases are in the other category. Are there any crackpots associated with UFOs? Of course there are. Of the 2,199 sightings, all of two percent were politely listed as psychological aberrations. It's a nice way of saying crackpot cases. Now, as a physicist and member of the American Physical Society, I have to assure you that the Physical Society says of the thousands of papers submitted to it, supposedly by physicists each year for publication, two percent are crackpot papers. Are there any crackpots associated with physics? Of course there are. About the same percentage as with UFOs. I'm one of the few people with a foot in each camp, but we're trying to change that. All right, the sightings we're interested in, my third category of reports, the unknowns. You'll notice that there were 434 unknowns. If you divide by 2,199 and believe the Secretary of the Air Force, the percentage unknowns ought to be 3%. You will notice that it is 19.7%. The percentage of unknowns was only six and a half times higher than we were told by the Secretary of the Air Force. Obviously, he wasn't very good at arithmetic. He also wasn't very observant, or he would have noticed this last category up here called insufficient information. It's made crystal clear in this report. They go out of their way to stress. If there wasn't enough information available about a site, if some vital piece of data was missing, the site absolutely could not be listed as unknown. It had to be labeled appropriately enough insufficient information. Exactly the opposite of what the public was told by the Secretary of the Air Force. He was obviously wrong on both counts. Now, the skeptic at this point would say, hey, those are interesting numbers, but 
You told us they did a quality evaluation of all those sightings. How do we know that those unknowns aren't just the junk and bum cases? Perfectly legitimate question. We don't know. So let's look at the next slide and we'll find out. The same 2,199 sightings, four quality categories on the left. In the far right column, you have the percentage in each quality grouping that was finally listed as unknowns. Take the excellent sightings, the top law. Far right corner, you'll see that 33.3%, one third of the excellent sightings were listed as unknowns. For the good sightings, we have just about a quarter, 24.8%. For the doubtful in four cases, just about a six. What we find here, in other words, is that the better the quality of the site, the more likely it was to be listed as unknown. It's exactly the opposite of what the skeptics always try to tell us. Dr. Carl Sagan from Cornell University, in a recent book, said there are no interesting sightings that are reliable and no reliable sightings that are interesting. The fact of the matter is that the situation is exactly the reverse of that. There's nothing surprising about this. It's exactly what you'd expect, this variation with quality. If the unknowns were really something different. But you see, that raises the $64 billion question. If the unknowns weren't aircraft, and they weren't balloons, and they weren't astronomical, and they weren't miscellaneous, and they weren't the ones for which there wasn't enough data, just what out of this world were they? You say, how in the heck do you get out of this world from just a bunch of numbers? Matter of fact, I've never been out of this world. But let's put the lights back up, the slide off, and I'll tell you why these data and lots of other data indicate that some UFOs are somebody else's spacecraft. Now, it's a combination of two things taken together. The physical appearance of the unknowns is reported by the witnesses, what the things look like, coupled with their behavior. I want to stress here, we're talking strictly about unknowns at this point. If you want to get very fastidious, think only of the excellent unknowns. There were plenty of those, too. Forget all the things that turned out to be Venus or the Goodyear blimp or all the other things that people had seen in the sky and couldn't identify. OK, what do they look like? Well, typically, we're dealing with apparently round, symmetric, disc-shaped, seemingly metallic objects, definite size, shape, surface texture protuberances that might be landing gear, might be antenna, might be windows, might be decorations, too. We don't really know. Those are all interpretations. Typically bigger in diameter than in thickness, size ranging from, say, oh, 10 feet in diameter up to a couple hundred feet in diameter. Smaller number of reports, much smaller, of a cigar-shaped object, same size range, and a few reports of a huge cigar-shaped mothership, hundreds and hundreds of feet long. Now, with just that physical description, there is obviously no basis at all for saying that these things come from off the Earth, since there are at least 50 different companies on the surface of planet Earth that could build things that look as I described. You know, McDonnell Douglas, Lockheed, Boeing, General Dynamics. So you put up the dough, and they'll build as many as you want. As a matter of fact, as a psychiatrist who, with that physical description data, has come up with a Freudian explanation for UFOs, believe it or not, Two psychiatrists from Harvard University have stated in a paper that was published that the round symmetric shape was obviously symbolic of the female breast. And these are tough times. We like to yearn back to when we were taken care of and fed and so forth. The huge cigar shape is an obvious phallic symbol. And so you put this together and forget flying saucers. Freud is trying to forget. The unfortunate thing is that they never provide a shred of data to substantiate this rather strange set of conclusions. They even ignored the several published papers by psychiatrists looking at UFO sightings who don't come to these conclusions at all. All right, as I said, the physical appearance data isn't enough to say that these things come from off the earth. But when you couple it with the behavioral data, that's when you're stuck with saying those things weren't made here. Because these round, metallic, disc-shaped objects seem to be able to hover, you know, sit still in the sky, move straight up, straight down, forward, and then back without turning around, move at extremely high speed horizontally, say 10,000 miles an hour, as measured on radar, make almost right-angle turns at very high speeds, 
I talked to a Navy man who described how he was watching the radar scope on the ship below decks. His buddy was on the deck of the ship that night as they watched, the buddy watched and he watched the scope. This object in the sky did five right angle turns in a row at 2,200 miles an hour. Now they thought that was rather interesting, so they entered it in the ship's log. Captain was up for promotion, he took it out of the ship's log, but that's a separate topic. Now, all of this rather unusual flying behavior, typically without any, or much noise, without any exhaust, without any visible external engines, without any wings, without any tail, without any red and green lights, and often with the glow on, not around the observer, but around the object. And I submit to you that in 1955, there was no company on the surface of planet Earth that could, in quantity, because people often reported seeing whole flocks of these things, that could, in quantity, build things that both looked as I described and acted as I described. If they weren't built here, they were built someplace else. Now, that doesn't tell us where, how, why, you know, what they're here for, or any of these other things. It just says not manufactured on planet Earth. Now, where do I think they're from? From some other solar systems nearby, our galactic neighborhood. And I'll name a specific place a little bit later. Not other galaxies, just down the street a little bit, around the corner maybe. Now, the guys who did this place were careful, competent, conservative professionals spending full time trying to identify UFO sightings. After they did all this sorting and sifting, this categorization work, they asked an obvious question. They said, is there really any difference between the unknowns and the knowns. You know, maybe we just missed the boat. Let's do a statistical comparison of the characteristics of these two groups. They were hoping that they would come out similar on the average, the same size, shape, speed, all that sort of stuff, and then we could forget flying saucers. They did what's called a chi-square statistical analysis. I won't go into the details of that. The chi-square tables are in the uh, Blue Book Special Report 14. The results are certainly worth quoting. They found that the probability that the unknown are just misknowns, is less than 1%. Less than 1% probability that the unknowns are just misknowns. That doesn't prove that they're different, because it's very unlikely that the unknowns are misknowns, because the two groups don't have any of the same characteristics, at least when it comes to size, speed, shape, color, that sort of thing. And one characteristic left out of this comparison, maneuverability which is certainly one of the most distinguishing features of the unknown as compared to the known. Another myth needs to be destroyed here because of information Blue Book Special Report 14. They have data on the duration of observation. You know, how long did people watch the things they reported that some other people decided were unknown? And the, the myth is that UFO sightings don't last very long. You know, maybe like that, a couple seconds, something like an automobile accident, that sort of thing. That's nonsense. The average unknown was observed for considerably longer than the average known. More than 60% of the unknowns were observed for longer than 60 seconds. More than 40% were observed for longer than 5 minutes. More than 10% were observed for longer than 30 minutes. They're simply not dealing, here at least, with short-term observations by incompetent observers seeing things under poor circumstances. Sure, there are plenty of cases like that. They're not the ones that concern all right, there's all sorts of other data in this report. It's the oldest, the largest, one of the ones you've been lied to the most about studies of UFOs ever done. All right, this is the UFO evidence. It's put out by the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena, NICAP as it's called. This was done in 1964, 180-some pages. It's got information on 746 unknowns sorted out from about 4,500 cases that NICAP people had investigated. It's got whole chapters on sightings by commercial pilots, by military pilots, by law enforcement officers. There's a chapter on sightings by engineers, scientists, astronomers. Very interesting chapter on evidence for intelligent control of some UFOs. Excellent source of data, all kinds of useful information, privately published, available only from NICAP. Most people don't even know that it exists. Let's look at the next one, another hard-to-get document. These are all listed on the uh, blue book listing. And the next slide, this is the Symposium on Unidentified Flying Objects, Hearings Before the Committee on Science and Astronautics, House of Representatives, Congress, that is, July 29, 1968. 
six scientists testified in person, six more of us in writing only, I was one of the latter group of six, and the written testimony of all 12, one of whom was a, is a professor here at UC Berkeley, the written testimony of all 12 was included in this 247 page document. It's interesting, if you write the Air Force for data on UFOs, they'll send you a couple of pages of information and a little list of stuff you can get from the government. This one is not on the list. Undoubtedly, because it's by far the best and because the data in it lead one to believe that some UFOs are somebody else's spacecraft. I should stress the 12 scientists cover a broad spectrum of professional backgrounds. Nuclear physics, astrophysics, uh, astronomy, psychology, sociology, biology, meteorology, civil engineering, uh, gravitational physics. Ten out of the 12 came out quite strongly pro-UFO. One was neutral. One was a retired Harvard professor of astronomy, Dr. Donald Menzel, who has consistently maintained in two books and numerous articles, including the one here, that there are no UFO sightings that he can't explain sitting at his desk at Harvard. No field investigation to recall. What's fascinating is to watch the Mendelian approach to solving UFO sightings. He starts with a conclusion, knowing that there are no flying saucers, and then adjusts the data to match his conclusion. In a typical case, mm -hmm. Lots of them. Uh, he likes temperature inversions. You know, where the air gets warmer as you go up in altitudes instead of cooler, and this bends the light rays and get mirages and other things like that. Case after case, temperature inversion, temperature inversion. So you do the calculations, which are fairly straightforward, as to how much of a temperature inversion would have been required for his explanation to be correct. And you get, say, 30 degrees. You check the weather records for that date, time, and place, and you find that there was a two degree temperature inversion. The Mendelian approach, in short, I'm afraid, was don't bother me with the facts. My mind's made up. They can't possibly be you. That's one way of looking at things. Not too unpopular way for that matter. But it's hardly an objective scientific way of looking at things. Now, the best paper in here, one that is objective and scientific, at least in my opinion, the best one I feel, is one by the late Dr. James E. McDonald. Jim was a professor of physics at the University of Arizona, a skeptic. He was challenged. He visited NICAP. He visited Project Blue Book. And he wound up, to his surprise, spending almost full time for almost three years investigating UFO sites. He personally interviewed over 500 witnesses. And almost all these cases were pre-screened cases, so he was looking at unknowns primarily rather than none. To make a long story short, he concluded that this is the most challenging problem of the scientific problem of our time that some UFOs are extraterrestrial, and that the Air Force Project Blue Book investigation was completely inadequate from a scientific viewpoint. And then, in order to face up squarely to the arguments made by the educated non-believers, Jim gave information on 41 separate sightings, which he'd investigated, subdivided into roughly seven groups, each one of these groups dealing with one of the objections raised by the educated non-believers. You know, things like, how come they've never been seen on radar? He gives you half a dozen radar cases. But why aren't they ever seen over big cities? I think they'd have sense enough to stay out of the smog, but he gives you half a dozen big city cases. But why are they always seen by only one witness, and that witness a kook, where you define kook as anybody who claims to witness a UFO approach? He gives you a bunch of multiple witness sightings, 20, 30, 50, 100 witnesses. Well, how come they're never seen by the professionals who watch the sky, the meteorologists, the pilots, the astronomers? He gives you a bunch of sightings for each of those groups. So you can raise any of those objections you want, but please don't reach a conclusion until you study the data. Because if you do study the data, you'll find that none of those objections, or any others I've been able to find, do stand up in comparison with the data. Ignoring the data, all the objections sound good. But again, that's not objective and scientific. This book was published in 1972. It's since been published in paperback. It's The UFO Experience by Dr. J. Allen Hynek, whose picture is up there. Dr. Hynek is currently a professor of astronomy at Northwestern University. He headed the Smithsonian tracking network set up when we first put up satellites. For 20 years, he was the Air Force scientific consultant on UFOs to Project Blue Book. For those of you with very long memories, in the mid-1960s, he was much better known as Dr. Swamp Gas. Remember all that fuss about marsh gas? Well, that was Dr. Hein. In this book, he makes crystal clear that he does not believe that UFOs can be swept under the swamp gas rug, or any other rug for that matter. He has information on more than 70 unexplainable sightings, 
average number of witnesses about four per second. A number of these were close encounters between earthlings and UFOs. He has a whole section on what was wrong with the Air Force Project Blue Book effort from an insider's viewpoint. He was there for 20 years. Now, don't ask me why he didn't change what they were doing. You might ask him sometimes to get the opportunity. He has a whole section on what should we do now, what can be done, what should be done, what might be done. He set up the Center for UFO Studies in the last couple of years to try to do some of these things. And he has a strong set of comments about the inadequacy of the University of Colorado's study of UFOs, the so-called Condon Report, the so-called scientific study of unidentified flying objects. It's usually referred to as the Condon Report because it's $539,000 study of UFOs done at the University of Colorado was completed under the direction of world-famous physicist Dr. Edward U. Condon. Now, Dr. Condon was 65 when he started this study, died in 1974, and frankly, we and he would both have been better off if he had retired instead of doing this piece of work. But he did a terrible job. Now, you'd never know that from the worldwide press coverage given at the completion of this study and its publication in January 1969. Headlines all over the world. Scientific study shows no UFOs. No benefit to science from study of UFOs. UFOs nonsense, scientists shows, and on and on in that vein. You read the small print. Fewer than 10% of the sightings couldn't be explained. That's just because there wasn't enough data. There were lots of editorial, some of them rather nasty one newspaper suggesting that now the UFO nuts can join that other crazy group, the Flat Earth Society, and let the rest of us do something useful. That was the tone. It was based entirely on the first two chapters of the book, namely Dr. Condon's summary and conclusions, and on an Air Force press release. And unfortunately, just as was the case with Project Blue Book Special Report 14, what the public was told and what the document shows are exactly the opposite. The data in this report make an excellent case for some UFOs as somebody else's spacecraft. For example, there's a whole chapter on sightings by orbiting astronauts. Three of those sightings remain unexplained to this day. I happen to think an orbiting astronaut is a reasonably trustworthy, loyal, honest, competent observer. Because if he isn't, we have no business trusting him with a few hundred million dollar space vehicle up there. Some people want it both ways. You know, here's a totally trustworthy guy, but if you see the flying saucer, don't believe him. That's nonsense. You know, it's like pregnancy, the R you are. It's the same with reliability. There have since been other sightings by orbiting astronauts that have made it out into the open. There's a whole bunch of other sightings that couldn't be explained in this. Now, I don't want to give you the impression that except for Condon's summary and conclusions, a great scientific study, it wasn't. For any physicist present, the chapter on plasmas and UFOs is just completely bad. For any historians present, the chapter on government involvement in UFO investigations is quite inadequate. There's no mention any place in 965 pages not one mention of the largest official scientific study ever done, namely Project Blue Book Special Report 14. It only covered 18 times as many cases as Condon's people covered. And if you're wondering whether Condon knew about it, yes, he did. I did inform him, got a letter back, thanking me for the data, and so forth. Now, I don't want to nitpick, really. We could spend another hour doing that. But let me give you the findings of a special subcommittee on UFOs set up by the world's largest group of space scientists, namely the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, the AIAA, an 11-man subcommittee on UFOs, people from universities, from industry, from the government. And they intentionally excluded anybody who had expressed a pro-UFO viewpoint. I'm a member of the AIAA, volunteer to be on the committee. Nope, they wouldn't have. It's the only subject I know. Or if you want honest professional opinions, you ask people who know absolutely nothing about it. That's one way of doing things. But anyway, the committee met many times. They spent three years going over the data. They read the Condon report. And they finally, very quietly, published their findings. No headlines, no editorials. This was in a technical journal. They noted that careful study of this report reveals that 30%, 30 percent, 30 percent of the 117 cases studied in detail could not be identified. Quote, the opposite conclusions from Dr. Khan could have been drawn from the contents of the report, namely that a phenomenon with such a high ratio of unexplained cases, 
should arouse sufficient scientific curiosity to continue its study. AIA has since had several sessions on UFOs, including one last September with 150-page document with papers by professionals coming out of it. Now, the reason that the careful study was required to find that 30% is that, believe it or not, almost a 1,000 pages of a book with that title been under the direction of a world-famous scientist, and yet there isn't even one chapter, not one, devoted to unidentified phenomena. Now, how in the world you can study this phenomenon without sorting and sifting the report, and throwing out those that can be explained, and throwing out those you don't have enough data for, and then spending almost all your time on what's in it? I don't know. Somehow they managed it, which is one of the reasons I don't think of this as being a very scientific study. Let me give you one sighting right out of the Condon report. Just sort of give you a flavor for the kind of stuff that's available if you go looking for it. And this way I can take care of several requirements. This is an Air Force case, it's a radar visual case, and Condon's group of studies it too, and it's been published in the scientific journal. So it covers a lot of ground. All right, this took place near Lake and Heath, England. Back in the mid-50s, two separate ground-based Air Force radar installations both pick up this strangely behaving object in the sky on radar. Now, I say strangely behaving because it would sit still, you know, hover, and then zip off at 600 miles an hour, fly several miles, stop dead. No visible acceleration or deceleration. It would sit there, and then it would zip off in another direction at 600 miles an hour. So it was zigzagging around in the sky. Now, the two radar installations, late at night, talk to each other on the radio. You see what I see? They each send somebody outside to look to make sure there really was something up there. It was at less than 6,000 feet altitude, as I recall. They agreed that in the first place there was something there. In the second place, it wasn't one of ours. They were also quite concerned because there happened to be a super secret U-2 reconnaissance airplane at a local base, and they were concerned about maybe somebody was trying to find out about it. So they scrambled a jet, a de Havilland Venom aircraft. They talk to the pilot, head him in the right direction. He radios back. I have visual confirmation of the unknown. He sees it. Keeps flying toward it. And pretty soon he says he has a radar lock on, meaning his guns are ready to fire and that there's something reasonably solid in a cone ahead of the aircraft. Nice friendly fellows we earthlings are, you know, shoot first, ask questions later. The next thing he says is a little bit different. He says, hey, where did it go? Ground says, it just circled around behind you. He looks back. Sure enough, where it will scare the heck out of you because, you know, airplanes can't do that. And the guy on the ground is watching the radar scope, two targets on it the whole time. The pilot spends the next seven or eight minutes going through all kinds of fancy high speed maneuvers trying to get away from the UFO, which is now chasing him. He about runs out of gas after several minutes, and he lands, the UFO takes off. Now, look what we have here. We have three separate sets of eyes, three separate radar installations. Behavior that you'd have to say is intelligently controlled, unless you believe that birds or meteors or balloons can behave the way this UFO did. The pilot didn't believe that. I've talked to the, one of the radar operators. He didn't believe that. And Condon's people didn't believe it either, and they so stated that they couldn't identify this sighting. It was one of more than 30 cases they couldn't identify. I have to give you the label that they placed on another report. It was a different sighting, but it gives you some insight into their thinking. They said that this other case was a natural phenomenon so rare that it had never been observed before or since. Like I say, that tells you about their thinking. It's not telling anything about UFOs. Let me do a quick check here now. Uh, how many people here have read a copy of the Congressional Hearings Doctrine? Just raise your hand if you have. One. How many people here have read a copy of um, the UFO evidence, the NICAP document? One, two, three, four, five. One reason for having you raise your hand is that you can get to know other people who are interested, which people are usually surprised if there's anybody else around who's read any of these things. How about the uh, Dr. Heinrich's book. Oh, quite a few. 4, 7, 9, 11, 13, 14. It's a race between Condon and Heinrich. How many have read the Condon report? Oh, Heinrich wins. No question. Alan likes to know how he's doing versus Dr. Condon. 
Okay, there's another reason for asking, which I'm not going to tell you. You'll find out later. All right, now obviously I am not going to be regaling you with sighting after sighting after sighting. And we haven't yet talked about the landings or the photographs or any of that stuff, the creature reports. But I've certainly shown you the tips of a lot of icebergs of ufological data, if you will. And the question one has to ask at this point is so how come with all this information, the big wheels of science and journalism haven't jumped on the pro-UFO bandwagon, as they obviously have. As far as I know, there are no courses on flying saucers here at Berkeley, at least ones for which you can get credit. Now, I don't want to give you the impression that most people don't believe in UFOs, because that would be a completely false impression. The noisy negative skeptics will always tell you that that's the case, but the Gallup poll of November 1973 showed that a majority of adult Americans do believe in UFOs. Of those who expressed an opinion, 65% said they do. The greater the education of the individual, the more likely to say that they're real, which is the opposite of what the skeptics say. And the older the individual, the less likely they feel that they're real, which isn't too surprising either. A poll of engineers and scientists taken five years ago showed that a majority of them believe that they're real. Obviously, in both instances, we're dealing with the silent majority. The noisy minority is definitely negative. So why haven't the big wheels jumped on the bandwagon? Well, how about it? Can you get to the stars or can't you? I will carefully ignore all the multitude of published studies proving it's impossible. All they prove is that if you make enough stupid assumptions, you can prove anything is impossible. I will tell you the results of a study that came to quite a different conclusion, however. This is a paper published in 1963, a very good but very obscure technical journal. The title of it was The Feasibility of Interstellar Traffic. It was by Dwayne Spencer and Leonard Jaffe of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory down at Caltech in Pasadena. And you probably don't need to be told that JPL's business is space hardware. You know, the Mariner program, the Ranger program, the Voyager program, the Viking program, the uh, Surveyor program, Pioneer. They build them, NASA puts them up, and JPL runs them. They don't just talk about them, is the point. Now, the title of the paper was The Feasibility of Interstellar Travel. Travel to the stars. And the question these guys asked was, is it feasible with the knowledge we have today and without violating any of the laws of physics to consider trips to nearby stars and expect to have the round trip time shorter than, say, 60 years, the average person's lifespan? Now, before answering that question, let's get one thing straight. They were talking about nearby stars. Now, the closest star to the sun is roughly five light years away. Within 50 light years, there are something like a thousand stars, of which 46 look interesting from the viewpoint of planets and life and so forth. These guys were interested in our local neighborhood. They were not interested in trips across the galaxy, you know, 80,000 light years that way or 20,000 light years that way. They were certainly not interested in trips to other galaxies. Andromeda, for example, next big one over 2 million light years away. They didn't care about those. They were certainly not concerned at all with trips to the ends of the universe, whatever that means, at least 10 billion light years away. They were interested in local neighborhood travel. Across the street, around the corner, next door, down the street. Now, I stress this for two reasons. One, I'm constantly being misquoted as saying, he says you can go to other galaxies. We're not talking about other galaxies. And secondly, the propulsion system problems are obviously quite different. It's like bicycles are flying around campus. Try to go from here to Johannesburg, South Africa on a bicycle. It's really not the right propulsion system to use. Okay, the answer to their question was, it is indeed feasible with the knowledge we have today, without violating any of the laws of physics as presently understood, to consider trips to nearby stars and expect to have round trip times shorter than 60 years. You say, what kind of crazy assumptions did those guys make? Fourth dimensional space-time warping, maybe, or uh, anti-gravity, or matter-antimatter annihilation? The techniques that the science fiction writers love to write about, of course. None of the above. Now, at this point, I better tell you that while I think flying saucers come here from other solar systems, I don't think they have to use either fission or fusion to get here. I think they probably use techniques about which we know nothing, because I've left something terribly important out of the discussion. 
you're probably wondering, so why in the heck do you mention fission or fusion if you don't think they work that way? Two reasons. In the first place, or at least half a dozen published studies that show that fission and fusion would do the job. In the second place, some people get very wrong with I can't explain every seemingly bizarre aspect of UFO behavior, like getting here from another solar system. They won't believe that it's real. Let's face it, whether I can explain it or not has nothing at all to do with whether it's real. I mean, the sun has been fusioning away up there for about five billion years. We figured out in 1937 how it works. Does anybody here want to suggest that it wasn't fusioning before 1937 because we didn't know about fusion before? That's nonsense. Now, the thing I've left out of the discussion, of course, is that five billion years of cosmic time. What in the world does that have to do with anything? Well, let's notice that we've had sophisticated technology for just about 100 years. First radio age, just about 100 years ago. Now, 100 years is a very tiny fraction of the five billion years that the system has been around. And yet, in just the last hundred years, we've increased our top speed for moving people around a thousand times over, a thousand times faster today than we could just a hundred years ago. Now, we didn't accomplish that progress by improving the old system, you know, building better sailboats, uh, breeding bigger horses, or anything like that. It was technology building on technology building on technology because technological progress comes from doing things differently in an unpredictable way. You're probably still wondering, well, what's that got to do with it? Simply this. Let us assume that some other thinking critters someplace else got started on their technological kick just a tiny bit before we did. But what's a tiny bit out of five billion years? Surely you'll give me a hundred years to wink an eye out of five billion. Well, if they got started just a hundred years before we did, we must very conservatively assume they can go at least a thousand times faster than we can, using techniques about which we know nothing. But let's be honest and a bit humble. It could just as well have been a thousand years before us that they got started on their technological kick. That's nothing out of five billion. Or 10,000, 100,000, even a million. It's still nothing out of five billion. And when I point out to you that the astronomers assure us that there are stars out there that are five billion years older than the sun, you begin to understand why I'm convinced that we're the Johnny come lately's in the system. That intelligent critters have been traipsing around between the stars for eons. Now, who in his right mind is going to tell us that he knows what the technology of even 100 years from now will be? Unless a thousand or a million or a billion. Because technological progress comes from doing things differently in an unpredictable way. That's not just a slogan. I've said it several times, but it's really the way it is. Take lasers and light bulbs, both sources of light. But a laser isn't just a better light bulb, it requires entirely new technology, new physics. And when Thomas Edison finished inventing the light bulb, he didn't say, oh boy, thank God that's done. Now I'm going to build me a laser. It's a lot more fun. Why make what seems to me a very stupid assumption? And that is that wherever there's life out there, it has to have developed there indigenously and independently of all life any place else. I'll bet there's practically nobody in this room whose ancestors lived in California 50 generations ago. Well, how did the rest of you get here anyway? Somebody migrated here, somebody colonized here, ran away here, crash landed here. For all we know, life as we know it on this planet could have gotten started as a result of colonization 10 million years ago or so. Or from crash landing. Or maybe this was the devil's island of this corner of the galaxy. They dumped all the bad boys and girls here. You can follow the Plutopia News Network at Plutopia.io. On Facebook, go to at Plutopia News. On Twitter, it's at Plutopia. With John Lepkowski, I'm Scoop Sweeney. This is the Plutopia News Network, 20 minutes into the future.